Welcome to this video on conflict classification. Today we will focus on non-international armed conflicts. While wars were mainly waged between independent sovereign states at the inception of modern IHL in the 19th century, this has changed significantly since World War II. Most of today's wars are non-international in character and often take place within the territory of a state. These so-called non-international armed conflicts, or NIACs, are often also referred to interchangeably as civil wars or internal conflicts by non-lawyers. NIACs are of a non-international character because they occur between, on the one hand, the government forces of a sovereign state, and on the other hand, what are known as organised armed groups. In addition, in certain cases, a non-international arms conflict can also exist between two or more organised armed groups without the involvement of a state, as we'll explore later in this lecture. So why is this distinction between non-international arms conflicts and international armed conflicts so important? The reason is that the treaty laws applicable to NIACs are much more limited than those applicable to international arms conflicts. The behaviour of the parties in a non-international armed conflict is limited mainly by the rules laid down in Common Article 3 of the 1949 Geneva Conventions and the 1977 Additional Protocol 2. Compared to the extensive regulations of international armed conflict, Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2 are rather rudimentary. However, this limited treaty framework is supplemented by certain rules of customary international law, which is of great importance. The jurisprudence of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia has confirmed that through the development of customary international law, the rules applicable to non-international armed conflict are almost identical to those applicable in international armed conflicts. The commentary of the International Committee of the Red Cross, which was first published in 2005, has come to a similar conclusion. Let us now look further into Common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. Common Article 3 is the central norm for non-international armed conflicts. Considering that until 1949 there was no specific treaty law dealing with internal armed conflicts, the inclusion of this provision in the Geneva Conventions after World War II was a major achievement. So which rights and duties can we find in Common Article 3? This provision contains a series of rights and duties which ensure a minimum level of protection to civilians and other persons who are not, or who are no longer, taking an active part in hostilities. Common Article 3 also identifies certain prohibitions relating to murder, the taking of hostages, and humiliating and degrading treatment. The International Court of Justice has even held that Common Article 3 embodies elementary considerations of humanity, thereby implying that respect for Common Article 3 is supposed to make situations of war more humane. While Common Article 3 provided a minimum level of protection in earlier years, the international community wanted to create a more detailed treaty regulating non-international armed conflicts after the terrible experiences of the wars against colonial domination and the Vietnam War. The result was the signing of the 1977 Additional Protocol 2, which develops and supplements Common Article 3. It guarantees, among other things, the fundamental protection of certain persons, including detainees, the wounded and sick, medical personnel and civilians. In some respects, however, Additional Protocol 2 has a more limited scope of application than Common Article 3. Common Article 3 applies to any armed conflict not of an international character occurring on the territory of one of the high contracting parties. As such, this also includes protracted armed violence between non-state actors. By contrast, Additional Protocol 2 always requires government forces, in other words a state, to be involved in the conflict. Moreover, under Additional Protocol 2, the organised armed group must have control over territory. Accordingly, the more detailed Additional Protocol 2 does not apply to civil wars, which are fought exclusively between rebel groups, such as the Lebanese Civil War in the 1970s or the Civil War in Somalia after 1991. The reasoning behind this higher threshold of application was that it might encourage states to sign up to such a treaty, 
which would set more detailed limits to warfare in non-international armed conflicts. Thus, we have now seen that both Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2 regulate civil wars, but that Additional Protocol 2 only applies to those with a higher threshold. Does this mean, however, that Common Article 3 applies to internal disturbances, riots, or every short-lived rebellion? The answer is no, it does not. This is because there are two criteria for the existence of a non-international armed conflict triggering the application of Common Article 3. First, the non-state actors must have a minimum level of organisation. This is a necessary condition for a rebel group to guarantee compliance with IHL. We have to keep in mind that international humanitarian law was originally designed for the armed forces of sovereign states, and therefore it's only applicable to non-state actors if their structure is somehow comparable to regular armed forces. Second, in a non-international armed conflict, violence must have a certain minimum level of intensity. The reason for this is that states want to be able to resort to a certain low level use of force against non-state groups or individuals for the purposes of law enforcement through its police forces, which would then not be regulated by the law of armed conflict. Taking both considerations into account, the Appeals Chamber of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, in its famous 1995 Tadic decision on jurisdiction, affirmed the following. Common Article 3 is only applicable to NIACs whenever there is protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organised armed groups, or between such groups within a state. But what does protracted mean, and how is the term organised defined? In the 2008 Harid and I decision, the respective ICT World Trial Chamber identified a number of indicative factors to assess whether an armed group satisfies the organisation criterion under Common Article 3. These indicators include, among others, the existence of a command structure, of disciplinary rules, a headquarters for the group, and territorial control, as well as the ability to access weapons and other military equipment, the capacity to recruit new members, and the ability to provide training. With regard to the intensity of violence threshold, the judges in the Harrod and I decision indicated that the following factors were important to consider, although not exclusive. The number, duration, and intensity of individual confrontations, the type of weapons and other military equipment used, the number of persons partaking in the fighting, the number of casualties, and the extent of material destruction. We have now reached our final question. And so when does IHL apply in a NIAC? Well, the answer is that the rules of IHL continue to apply until the internal armed conflict comes to an end. This is the case for both non-international armed conflicts regulated by Common Article 3 and those falling under Additional Protocol 2. The end of a conflict can be marked by the achievement of a peaceful settlement between the warring parties. By way of example, a peace agreement was concluded between the government of Colombia and the FARC rebel movement in October 2016. To recap, in this video we have discussed the notion of non-international armed conflicts. In particular, we've seen the circumstances in which an internal conflict triggers the protections provided to civilians, detainees and the sick and wounded under both Common Article 3 and Additional Protocol 2.